Maniga. Uh, the first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the sound of their voices, the, the sound of their voices, the doorposts and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. The second reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in God's position to the praise of his glory. Amen. The last reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 11, <clears throat> verses 25 to 30. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the review of the Lord. Amen. Good morning. 
to bring you God's word, God's message to you. I don't know about you, but there have been many times and where I have gone well in my life. Absolutely well, because that moment has been so incredible. Probably among those is that the day I walked down the aisle to meet John at the bottom and get married. What a wow moment. The birth of our children. To see those little faces for the first time and hold them in your arms. Wow. Our daughter's wedding, Samantha and, and Wesley's wedding. And to watch her come down the aisle with John and to watch Wesley's expression. Wow. Our son's wedding. And to have watched Cara come down the aisle with her dad and what, stand there watching Michael and his reaction. What a wow moment. And I think many of us can say there have been many wow moments in our lives where we've gone, this is wow, it's amazing, what a gift from God. Sunrises, and I mean we've got, at this time of year especially, they are incredibly beautiful. But all of those wow moments are not as incredible and as wow as what Isaiah experienced. And we read about that this morning. Isaiah was given a vision of God in God's glory. And what an experience. What a wow moment that was. In Isaiah's vision of God, he saw the Lord. The Lord seated on the eternal throne. Can you imagine that? Whoa. Absolutely awesome. A goosebump moment. Now for Isaiah, this was incredibly significant. He needed that vision at that moment. Why? Well, the king of Judah... And if you go back into the history of Israel, you will find out that Judah was split, uh, Israel was split up into the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. And so the king of Judah, King Uzziah, also known as Azaria, had just died. And Uzziah had been one of those good kings of Israel or of Judah. He had done pretty much what he was supposed to do. But as we all know that, yes, he is an earthly king, and no matter how good and how wonderful, yeah, we are all flawed. And so was King Uzziah. And in his pride, he had marched off to the temple and gone into the temple into the holy place where only the priests were allowed to go and offer incense. And there he went and offered incense. And he was struck by God with leprosy. And yes, Uzziah spent the rest of his life in isolation. And then eventually he had died. And so now Israel was once again without a king until his son ascended to the throne, and this was a low point in Isaiah's life. And it is at this point that God gives him this vision. Because yes, Isaiah's earthly king may be dead, but oh wow, his heavenly king is alive. He is alive and reigning on his throne forever and ever and ever. A king who is above all and is exalted above all. And here in this beautiful vision of Isaiah's, we get such a beautiful picture of our triune God. Probably one of the most difficult things for us to understand 
or to even wrap our heads around is how God can be three people. How God can be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Quite a difficult thought, eh? I remember our children. Um, yeah, they, they were trying to understand this. And John used to read to Samantha and Michael at this point. They were preschoolers. And he would read, do a Bible reading with them every night, faithfully before bedtime. And they tried to understand this, especially Samantha, who was the older one, and she questioned, but Dad, how can this be? How can Jesus be God? Well, John explained it this way to her. Well, to her and Michael. That he, John, is a person. He is their father. But he is also their father, their, their, um, his parents or her grandparents' son, and he is my husband. And yes, it, that illustration might not totally explain the whole Trinity to us, but it just helps us that little bit to understand God a little bit better. Isaiah's vision gives us that beautiful portrait of God as Father, God as Son, and God of the Holy Spirit. God the Father was not visibly seen in this vision because, you see, God nobody can see God and live. And here we even have the seraphs who are covering their face in the presence of God because of God's greatness, God's glory, God's wowness. God the Father is revealed through the seraphs' actions in the way that they sing their praise in God's presence. And they are recorded as singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Wow. Can you imagine them? Can you just imagine that? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Oh. God's holiness is emphasized. They don't just go, holy is God. No, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. Yes, God's love is enormously great for us. But God is also holy. God is without spot or blemish, without sin, without any evil thought or deed. God is entirely and wholly pure. Let's just ponder that for a moment. How incredibly pure God is. We are so quick to forget that God is holy. God gets used almost like an everyday object these days. And treated like an everyday object. We forget that he is a holy God above us. But along with God's holiness, we also learn that he is almighty. We read that he is all-knowing, all-powerful, and everywhere. God our Father is above everything and above all. He is able to do anything and everything. We are reminded in Genesis at creation how God just spoke and things happened. And things came into existence. Out of nothing, God created 
everything. Wow. And we are also reminded that with God, all things are possible. We look at Abraham and Sarah. There was Sarah. How old was she? What, 90 or something? Old. Really old. Way beyond childbearing. And guess what? She had a baby. Wow. And that was because God had said so. God had made that possible. The angel Gabriel came to Mary. And he said, Mary, you're going to have a baby. He is going to be the son of the of God the Most High. He is going to be Emmanuel, God with us. And Mary goes, whoa, 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 hang on, wait a minute. How can this be possible? I can't have a baby. And the angel Gabriel says, all things are possible with God. This morning, we have We've had a testimony from Ryan, who who shouldn't be with sitting with us. But yes, he is here. Because all things are possible with God. God is able to make the seemingly impossible possible. Every miracle that's recorded in the Bible. Every miracle that has taken place through the ages and that still happens today bear witness to God our Father, to God's almightiness, to his great power. We also read that the seraphim give glory to God and they say, The earth is full of God's glory. And as we look around us, we can see that glory displayed. As the sun comes up every morning, as it sets each evening, every mountain, bird, plant, animal bring testimony to God's glory. Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 1 chapter uh, chapter 1 verse 20 for since create the creation of the world god's invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen been understood from what has been made the famous author goethe um, a german poet and writer said Nature is the living, visible garment of God. Wow, what an incredible picture we have of God, our Father, the Almighty. But we also see in Isaiah's vision that portrait of Jesus Christ. Isaiah sees the Lord, Jesus, on his throne. After Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, he went to sit on the throne. God, his Father, had exalted him to the highest place. Jesus was obedient in all he did. No question. He came to earth born as a mere baby. He could have come as an adult. God. But no, he humbled himself and came as a baby. And he did not choose to be born in a big fancy palace to wealthy, well-to-do parents with lots. No, instead he came and was born in a stable, a lowly place, a humble place. Jesus lived his entire life in obedience to the Father. And we think of that picture of where he went into Gethsemane and he prayed 
May this cup be taken from me, Father, but not as I will, as you will. So he humbled himself and he died on the cross. Jesus, the obedient son, became the ultimate sacrifice for all of our sins. If we look around the world, we see how bad things are. And they seem to be just getting from bad to worse to worst. And yes, if we wonder, can it get any worse? Well, if you read the rest of Isaiah and you go to Revelation, oh boy, we are in for it. It is going to get worse, a lot worse. However, there is always good news. We have spoken about how God is holy and hates sin, but he loves the sinner. To make atonement for sin, there had to be the shedding of blood. And this requirement started right out in the beginning where Adam and Eve had sinned, and God came to them and he brought them clothes, clothes made of the skins of animals to cover their shameful nakedness. Blood had to be shed to get those skins. And then we continue to see how Abel does his sacrifice. Again, a sacrifice where blood was involved. The whole of the tabernacle worship, the whole of the temple worship was all set around that sacrifice of blood. The seraphim removes that coal from the altar to cleanse Isaiah. The altar was a place where blood of the animals was shed to make atonement for that sin. And here comes that picture of Christ's atonement through his blood for our sin. Paul in his letter to the Ephesians wrote about Christ's blood as we read this morning, that it was shed for our redemption. Jesus has done everything, everything, through his death on the cross for us. But, and all we need to do is to say yes, is to confess and to accept. It was as we see with Isaiah, it was only once he had said and cried out, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. That that seraphim took the coal and cleansed him and said, You are now clean. What significance. <coughs> wow. God is faithful. God is just, and he will cleanse us of our sins when we confess and repent. And how do we get to that? How do we get reminded of that? Well, that brings us to the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. As we look closer at Isaiah's vision, we see it speaks of the seraphim, now, seraphim means fiery. They were fiery. And here we have that picture of the Holy Spirit. So often we've, we've read of the fi this, fi this fire of the Holy Spirit coming. That day on Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples, there were the tongues of fire. Jesus spoke to his disciples of how they would be baptized by the Holy Spirit and with fire. We are not only told about the Holy Spirit that cleanses us, but also about the power the Holy Spirit has. Indeed, fire is often used to clean and purify things. 
It's used to burn out impurities in metals like gold. And we see in that vision of Isaiah how the coal cleanses his lips. The prophet Malachi also spoke of how God will cleanse the people with a refiner's fire. Jesus spoke how we would all be salted by fire. And Paul wrote that we will also be tested by fire. It is the the Holy Spirit. It is he who reminds us when we have gone wrong. The Holy Spirit, he comes and he taps you. He says, hey, listen. Oi, that wasn't the right thing to do. That wasn't nice what you said. This is not how God wants you to behave. The Holy Spirit is he who reminds us to confess and to ask for forgiveness. However, that's not the only job of the Holy Spirit. He also gives us the wisdom and the power and the guidance and the leadership. But we also read how we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Cattle are often sealed with a metal brand. That metal brand, where does it come from? The fire. Again, we have that picture of the fire. And that is to indicate this cow belongs to this farmer. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit, which means we belong to God. Wow. What a beautiful picture that we belong to God. And we can know that because the Holy Spirit has sealed us. Like Isaiah, we have been given an incredible and wonderful picture of God. We have all of creation around us that testifies to God's greatness, to his glory. We have God's word. We have Jesus. We have been given everything to know to understand and to have a relationship with God. And all we need to do is confess and accept. And yes, once we have done that, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. and We can know that we always and ever will belong to God. I don't know about you, But to me, that is the greatest and the most amazing and the biggest wow in the world. Have you accepted Christ? Are you sealed with the Holy Spirit? Amen. Let us pray. Yes, Father God, thank you that your greatness, your holiness is so enormous, is so incomprehensible to us. But also with that greatness and that holiness comes your great love and your compassion and your mercy. And that, yes, you gave your only begotten Son because you loved the world so much. And that, yes, Lord Jesus, you came, you offered your life, and that through you we have forgiveness and eternal life. Oh, and Holy Spirit, thank you that we can know, that we have that assurance, that we are sealed, and that we are forever and ever God's child. And so, Lord, this morning, we give you thanks and praise for all that you have done. And we pray and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.